Other than that, our wo women's fellowship committee, this may be dangerous, but I'm going to show faith. And the women's fellowship committee has an announcement to make, after which we will have our prelude. Okay, again, I'm Stacy Cagle, chair of the Women's Fellowship Committee, and I'm so excited because my cousin, who I've been inviting for a whole year now to come to SVC, has finally come. This is Runs with Scissors, and she is going to make an announcement that uh, I just want all y'all to hear. Come on, cuz, get up there. <laughs> Howdy! <laughs> I am Runs with Scissors, and I am so excited to be here. You can call me Runs with Scissors. I'm as excited as a cat with puppies all the way from Southern Bucksnard I have come just to see you all and attend the amazing birthday bash that's coming up this Saturday. Don't forget, it's this Saturday. That's May the 6th. It's going to be in the uh, Solid Rock... The... The Solid Rock Cafe, it's going to be from 2 to 4, and it's for all the women. Come and help the women that have birthdays in April and May and June. Come and help them celebrate their birthdays. There's going to be free cake, there's going to be ice cream, and especially because we have an award-winning decorator from my neck of the woods. And she's bringing with her some of her wonderful people creations for our very own models to, to model. In fact, take a look at this amazing straw hat. She did this just for me so that I could wear this today as my straw hat for you so that you could see some of the samples of her work. So I cannot afford simply to stay away. I promise you, and it's for all the women. Did I remember to say that? It's for all the women. And by the way, just before I forget, I wanted to let you know, what do you call a newspaper column that gives fashion advice? Wait for it. It's called an article of clothing. Now I gotta stop because I promised the pastor I wasn't gonna go starting to preaching instead of the pastor, and I'll let him do his own joke. So remember, it's for all the women Saturday, two o'clock and four o'clock. See you. Bye. Good morning. The call to worship today comes from Psalm 98, verse 7 through the end. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. 
So let us all stand and sing hymn number 272, worship him with hail to the Lord's anointed. Let us pray. Our great God and Father, we are so thankful. We come to you thanking you for the things you've done and continue to do. You created the heavens and the earth and the seas then all that in them is. You've set aside a people for yourself, and you're the author and the finisher of our faith. You provide for and uphold us in every little thing, every moment, every day, and you will send your son in your own good time to judge the quick and the dead to bring your sons and daughters home and have us blessed with everlasting life and eternal reward we thank you so many times for these things we come before you today more than that to bow before you not for what you've done but for who you are infinite in being and glory blessedness and perfection all-sufficient, eternal, unchangeable, incomprehensible, everywhere present, almighty, knowing all things, most wise, most holy, most just, most merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And so, Lord, today we come here to thank you for what you have done, but we love you for who you are. Accept our praise, O Lord, because of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be seated. The Old Testament lesson today is from 2 Samuel, chapter 14, starting at uh, verse 19.
The king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? And the woman answered and said, As surely as you live, my lord the king, one cannot turn to the right hand or to the left from anything my lord the king has said. It was your servant Joab, Joab who commanded me. It was he who put all these words in the mouth of your servant. In order to change the course of things, your servant Joab did this. But my Lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God to know all things that are on the earth. Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I grant this. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, in that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. Now, in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut, his hair, and when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekels by the king's weight. There were born to Absalom three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a beautiful woman. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but Joab would not come to him. And he sent a second time, but Joab would not come. Then he said to his servants, See, Joab's field is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servant set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and went to Absalom at his house and said to him, Why have your servant set my field on fire? Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent word to you. Come here that I may send you to the king to ask why have I come from Geshur. It would be better for me to be there still. Now, therefore, let me go into the presence of the king. And if there is guilt in me, let him put me to death. Then Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. This is the word of the Lord. And so now we come to a time of confession. God says that if we are, uh, confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive. And so we do that now first with um, there in your order of worship together out loud in a general prayer of confession and then right after in silent prayers. And together we pray, Almighty and everlasting God, we acknowledge and confess that we are unworthy sinners who deserve your displeasure. With heartfelt sorrow, we repent and deplore our many offenses. Have compassion on us, Father of mercies. Forgive our sins and cleanse our unrighteousness. Remove our guilt, mortify the deeds of our flesh, and grant us the daily increase of your Holy Spirit that we may bear the fruit of your Spirit in full measure. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you with this access to ask forgiveness of so great a king, so great a judge. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive us of the sins that we've silently laid bare before you, but you know the hearts, that you would cleanse this as well, the things that we know and have tried to keep hidden, 
and the things we have forgotten about. And it's through his son that we ask your forgiveness. Amen. The assurance of forgiveness today um, comes from Hebrews chapter 7, and we make a whole lot of, and should, the promises of God, and we do about forgiveness and salvation of all these things from the very beginning. You know, we have heard how many times the gospel's preached in Genesis uh, when he talks about the seed of a woman and crushing the head of the serpent and he's going to send somebody. And from there, over and over again, the promises of God are with us, that he will be our God, that, uh, that he will be our God and he's going to, and that we're going to be his people, that he's going to send his son born of a woman. We read of the prophecies in Isaiah. But one of the things that is neglected or that I neglect is not just the promises of God, but what's called the oath of God, the pledge of God. God doesn't just say, I'm going to promise to do that. I don't know how many times I have promised to do things. And the list grows of the things that uh, are left undone. But God puts up a pledge in Scripture called different things, a surety, um, a guarantee, right? Today we'd say that God didn't just promise, but he swears an affidavit or he puts up collateral over and over in Scripture. And today um, that is where I'm getting assurance, is from the actual surety that he puts up, not just promising. In Hebrew chapter 7, he's talking about Christ and his eternal priesthood and how he's like the other priests in that he makes intercession. But unlike the other priests, in verse 20 of Hebrews 7, he says, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one, that's Jesus, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. And so when we ask and we plead God, look at what Jesus has done boldly, we can do that on the basis of we're willingly ask him for nothing that the son has not already asked him for. He's put up this pledge, I will do this. That's the problem that I have. I know that God can, he's all powerful. But he's pledged that he will. If you call out to him, he's there. He refuses none. Because he looks on the lamb that was slain right there in the midst of that throne. He sees the blood and he has promised to confer all of the blessings that that blood has purchased. He's promised the son And what does the Father deny the Son? Nothing. Jesus said that the Father always hears him. And so not on the basis of my prayers, my confessions, but on Christ's own pleading for me and the sake of the Son of his love, he never denies any who call upon him. So you can call upon him, and if you have, you can know for a surety with his own pledge and oath that your sins are are forgiven. And all God's people said, all right, and to sing to him and the way that he has done this, let us stand and sing hymn number 477, the old rugged cross.
Please be seated. That was some good singing. I believe you know that hymn, don't you? <laughs> welcome to all of you. We're so glad to have you on the, here today on this uh, beautiful day. We welcome our visitors very warmly. So glad to have you with us as well. Please pass the attendance uh, pad. And if you don't mind signing your name, we'd love to have a record of your uh, worshiping with us this morning. should be found on the inside aisle. Just pass it down and sign it. Uh, you heard the uh, lady's announcement about the birthday bash next uh, uh, Saturday, is it, I think, next Saturday. Uh, I, I've got one better than that, sponsored by our young adult class who wants to uh, honor our senior members. We have a church-wide birthday party celebration, food, cake, right here. June the 11th for one person and we'll do it for you if you live long enough <laughs> you've got to get to a hundred and our dear brother Jim Myrick who's not here today we're praying hard he, he'll make it his 100th birthday is June the 9th and so the young adult uh, class is going to sponsor a big birthday party for him with hot dogs, hot food. I'm not sure the, all the details yet, but I want you to go ahead and mark your calendars. You'll need to make a reservation so we have enough food, but it'll be right here right after the service, table set up, and we'll have the food ready so you don't have to stand around and wait. Uh, so mark your calendars and let's look forward to that. Let's pray for Jim's health between now and then. Uh, our treasurer has a report, which usually means the offering the previous week wasn't too good, <laughs> <laughs> or that we're nearing the end of the quarter, or both, and so Dale Welling, we welcome you, after which time we will honor God with his tithe and our offerings. Thank you, Jim, and good morning to all of you. I know I'm about to deliver the most anticipated thing of the day when I say I'm doing the treasurer's report. So, not bogging you down with a lot of numbers and stuff, I got all my notes right here on this long list. So, first of all, last time I was up here, I told you about how happy the treasurer was. And I want you to know the treasurer is still happy. Things are going well. That uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. And we continue to... Uh, grow in not only in their numbers but also in our revenue. First and foremost though before I get into anything else I want to say thank you to all of you for your faithful and generous support to the church. You know God has blessed us with a great facility and, and a great congregation like this and, and staff and we, we do appreciate that and thank the Lord for it. I want to say that uh, things are going well, not great, well. And the treasurers are never happy, you know that. So, so yes, we, we are doing well and uh, especially want to recognize the fact that we have been able to uh, stay on budget or uh, slightly above ahead the budget to, through this fiscal year, which started back in July. We are now in the last quarter of our fiscal year budget for this year. At present, we uh, have about 83% of the year behind us, and we got about 81% of the revenue collected. So we're, we're doing pretty well. But if you pay attention to the bulletin, bulletin and look in there where it has a treasurer's report, you see that we're starting to feel the effects of warm weather and vacations and lots of other things like that. So, 
So we are thankful for what we've been able to, to accomplish this year through the regular budget and for the special gifts that we had that uh, I want to acknowledge the classrooms upstairs and what's been done there. Those are almost finished now. They're down to the final inspections, right, Dave? Shake your head, yes. All right, okay, good. They're down to the final inspections, and, and if you haven't had a chance to go up and see the see them and look at the youth area where they're going to put it, they put in a small kitchen and and there's going to be popcorn and other things in there. It's we appreciate that, especially to be able to help with the with the youth program and the children's program. As I mentioned, the budget years rapidly ending we got two months left on it and historically the last two months of the uh, of this budget year fall in months that are not the highest in giving a lot of a lot of activities going on a lot of tra a lot of traveling that sort of stuff so i ask you to keep in mind that we do have online giving i appreciate all of you not not only all, all of you who are watching us as well as all of you who participate regularly on online giving. We appreciate that a lot, and we ask you to consider that during your travels, and hopefully that won't interrupt your happiness while you're out vacationing and doing those things. So I appreciate that, and, I, and I'll, once again, I want to say thank you for your generous and, and faithful support to the church, and I want to say thank you to the Lord for what he's done at Stevens Valley. So God bless all of you. Thank you.
Let us pray. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. We are blessed so abundantly here. And I pray that these gifts that you have given us would take root to flower and advance your kingdom, not be thorns and briars. God, I pray that we would be cheerful givers, knowing that we can decide rightly how to advance your kingdom with these gifts that you give. We thank you for them. We pray that we remain cheerful. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue our study in the book of Ephesians, so turn there, if you would, to chapter 6. We've made it to the final chapter where we will spend uh, several weeks. If you have been with us on previous occasions, you may recall that back in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul said, Don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. If you want to get drunk, <laughs> get drunk with the Spirit of God. And uh, sometimes we use that phrase, being filled with the Spirit, or a Spirit-filled person, and people get, all, people get all sorts of exciting ideas as to what that means, and uh, sometimes think it means it's a, that's a person who uh, has phenomenal, extraordinary, even miraculous powers, powers of healing, and words of knowledge and prophecy and speaking in tongues and uh, uh, things of that nature. But I would suggest to you that as the Apostle Paul used that phrase, a spirit-filled person, uh, he had in mind far more basic things. He had in mind uh, marriages, and he had in mind families. And he had in mind the marketplace. He had in mind how we treat each other. That we uh, love one another as we're commanded to do. If you were here last week, we talked about a spirit-filled marriage. What does that look like? Well, it looks like a wife who submits to her husband and who respects her husband. And it looks like a husband who loves his wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Submission's not an issue when the husband loves his wife that way. So there's a very beautiful, loving reciprocity in a spirit-filled marriage. Today, Paul uh, will focus his attention on family life, children, parents, and the marketplace. Uh, how does the Spirit of God manifest himself where you work? for example. So let's pray that the Lord will speak to us from his word. Father, we thank you for our time together. <clears throat> we thank you for your word. We know that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So give us ears to hear. Open our ears, open our minds that we might receive with meekness the engrafted word of truth for Christ's sake. Amen. Ephesians 6 verse 1, children, Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them, and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. I believe that God has put 
within each of our hearts a deep longing and yearning for a loving, caring family, a place to belong, a place to call home, a place we can be ourselves, uh, a place of support. Family life may may bring up different images in your mind. Some may envision a happy family being a father and son playing golf together or throwing the ball in the backyard while the the dog runs around and barks and carries on. Or you may see in your mind a mother and daughter cooking brownies together in the kitchen. Or you may see uh, the, the, the broader family gathered at Christmas around the tree in a beautiful picture with the, the girls and all wearing matching outfits. Or you may see a Thanksgiving dinner with a big turkey and dressing and everybody having a great time. There's a reason so many of those Dorman Rockwell uh, paintings resonate with us. Uh, we, we identify with the, the joy of a very happy family. Unfortunately, they're hard to find. Uh, one colleague tells of a young boy who grew up with a very harsh father and he endured dinner each evening silently so as not to provoke an outburst from his father. And once his dinner was over, particularly in the summer months, he would sometimes walk down the street to a neighbor's home, uh, to a friend's home, I should say, and he would crawl under the porch that was easily accessible where he could hear his friend's family having dinner and talking and laughing. And he would sit there in the dark and silently dream of what it might be like to hear laughter at his own dinner table. Well, the Lord tells us how. He tells us what a happy, healthy family looks like. And you notice in, in all of these relationships that Paul addresses the subordinate party first. Wives, then husbands, children, then fathers, slaves, and then masters. So he begins with children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. A long time ago, God gave Ten Commandments. You're familiar with them. And number five is honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Number five is right in the middle, isn't it? It's the hinge between the first four and the, uh, the last five. The first four tell us how to love God, how to honor Him. The last five tell us how to honor and love our neighbor. And that fifth one's right there in the middle. It tells us how to do both. Because when we honor our parents, whether we're grown children or young children, when we honor our parents, we honor God. They are God's ordained representatives for us. You may find this hard to believe, and children don't like to hear it. But way back there in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, as a matter of fact, Rebellious children were told to be brought before the elders. And parents were not told to take away their computers or cell phones or things of that nature. They were to be brought before the elders who would stone to death incorrigible children. Because to rebel against parents was to launch a coup against Almighty God. It's hard to be a parent. Many of you know that. We, we learned on the job, didn't we? I had five chances. I think I blew five, all five chances. Sometimes I feel very bad about that. Some of you only had one or two chances, but we, we had five. And, you know, you get stressed, and your blood pressure gr goes up, and uh, you sure do appreciate obedient, compliant children. And you, I see some white hair out there. 
And, and I, I see a lack of hair in some places as well. And I, I tell people I used to have a lot of hair. And then along came five children. I like the story about the little girl who looked at her mother one day and she said, Mommy, why do you have some white hairs? And the mother sensed a wonderful teaching opportunity. So the mother said, Honey, every time you disobey me, one of my hairs turns white. <laughs> and the little girl thought about that and she sensed a, a, a bounce back opportunity. And she said, Mommy, is that why all of Grandmommy's hairs are white? <laughs> Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Then he turns to fathers, verse 4. Somehow the mothers escaped this passage. I don't know how that happened, but fathers, verse 4, do not provoke your children to anger, <clears throat> but bring them up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. So the father is the head of the home, as we saw last week, and Paul puts the onus on the father, not the mother, to raise his children in the nurture and instruction, or some of your versions may say the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's the father who, who's responsible before God to get the kids to church, to get them to Sunday school, to create a, what we might call a faith culture in the home. And he's responsible, furthermore, not to exasperate or frustrate or provoke his children to anger. If he's a hypocrite, he will frustrate his children. If he says, my faith is the most important thing to me, but he never goes to church, uh, never prays, never reads his Bible, it will frustrate, provoke, exasperate the children. If he disciplines his children, but never forgives them, they'll be provoked, they'll become angry and embittered. Or if he's just too busy, you know, to provide for the families, he's got to go to work five days, maybe six days a week, he travels all the time. If he's indifferent and aloof and detached, the children will miss out and will be frustrated. Travis read... Uh, that rather sad story about Absalom a few moments ago. Absalom murdered Amnon because Amnon raped Tamer. If you want some exciting history, <laughs> sad history, uh, read it there, 2 Samuel 12, 13, 14. It all can be traced back to David's own sin with Bathsheba. <clears throat> the sword never departed from his house thereafter. But you realize that Amnon, uh, uh, Absalom excuse me, fled and lived in Gesher for three years, totally estranged from his father. And only through Joab serving as a mediator of some sort was he brought back into Jerusalem where David as king was. But for two more years, David kept his son at arm's length. He'd have been a good football player, good old stiff arm. He shall not see my house. No, no father should, much less a Christian father, should keep his son at arm's length like that. And finally, when they kissed and apparently made up, apparently they didn't make up. Because you read the next chapter, and you know what happened? Absalom, Absalom led a revolt against his father, a coup. So Absalom is a classic example of an unloved, undisciplined, estranged son kept at arm's length. And unfortunately for David, Absalom had the gifts and the talents to make his father pay dearly for it. Fathers, don't exasperate, don't provoke your children. Our middle daughter, Rachel, spent a little time studying at Oxford <clears throat> some 15 or so years ago. And 
a few years before she went there, I was reading an article about Oxford, and Oxford had admitted a, a prodigy, a 13-year-old girl, mathematics prodigy. And she was admitted to study there because she was so brilliant. But two years later, her name was Sophia Yusuf. She was a Muslim. But two years later, this brilliant girl turned to prostitution. And the article quoted uh, a friend of hers who said, it's all desperately heartbreaking. With her amazing brain, she should be able to make money any way she wants. But instead, her life just spiraled completely out of control. You wonder, how, how in the world could that happen? And the last sentence of the article says, Yusuf claims her father was controlling and bullying, which led her to ending the relationship with her family. We sometimes think these things aren't so important, but they really are. A spirit-filled father is a worshiping man. He's got his priorities in order. He knows he's a forgiven sinner, probably twice the sinner his kids ever were. And he loves, he loves the mother of his children. And he loves his children and resolves to bring them up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. By the way, it's never too late. If you're like me, you think, well, I had five chances, I blew it. Well, you're still a father. And it's never too late to set the right example. Well, having talked about family life, making us all feel guilty, I'm sure, uh, Paul then turns his attention to the marketplace, and, and we're reminded that the gospel affects every relationship, and that life is lived coram Deo, before God, before the face of God, and that no matter our station in life, we're called upon to serve the Lord to bloom wherever we've been planted, as others have said. We don't have slaves and masters, but we do have employees and employers, don't we? So, slaves, verse 5, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. We're supposed to have our heart in it, Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. So, in other words, whether we're serving our boss or, or working or even playing for our coach, uh, we're to do it as unto the Lord. And with that attitude, even the most mundane of labor and service can be transformed into ministry that is glorifying to the Lord. We're to do it all as unto the Lord and to get rid of this idea that we're victims. Boy, we're infected with, with victim uh, theology these days. We're all oppressed. We're all victims. No, the Lord has us where He wants to have us and calls upon us to bloom where we're planted, and turn work into ministry. This, by the way, was what transformed in part Martin Luther's life. If you read about Martin Luther, you know that uh, Luther thought life was divided into two parts, sacred, secular. And if you want to live the sacred life, you've got to leave the secular life, the the dirty life, the big bad world behind, go into a monastery. So he did, but he found no peace with God at all. He, he did all he was supposed to do. He prayed and fasted and counted beads and, and uh, translated Scripture and so forth and so on, but he had no peace with God until he read Romans 5.1. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And as Luther continued to study the Scriptures, he discovered that of him, through him, to him are all things. And life is lived before the face of God. Therefore, everything we do has value. And we're to glorify God and enjoy him 
regardless of where he has put us at this particular point in time. Or to say it another way, the little servant girl with a broom may serve Christ as well, if not better, than the monk at the monastery. And then finally, he, he turns his attention to the masters. Paul does. Masters, verse 9, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. Being translated, we are all accountable. And while it may be an advantage here on earth to be the, uh, a master or an employer or a boss, it may prove to be a disadvantage hereafter. If we've not served as unto Christ, if we've not been spirit-filled leaders and employers, a threatening master, a bullying, intimidating, harassing person is not filled with the Spirit of God. One who's only concerned about the bottom line is not Spirit-filled. People are more important than prophets. Jesus didn't care about his own prophet. He cared about our prophet. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and give his life a ransom for many. I was reading recently about a man named Michael Abrashoff. Uh, Michael Abrashoff was a, a naval assistant working for William Perry back in the mid-1990s. Perry was the U.S. Secretary of Defense. And Abrashoff was given his own ship called the USS Benfold. And the USS Benfold was rated as the worst ship in the entire Pacific Fleet. So suddenly this man was, was given the ship. He was a captain or the admiral, whatever they call him. And uh, he was given no authority to hire, no authority to fire, no, author no authority to promote, no authority to demote. But lacking authority, he nevertheless was able to transform the culture on that ship by empowering and validating the crew. Crew members would come to him, they have a problem, they have an issue, and he would say to them, it's your ship, what would you do? And believe it or not, within 12 months, the USS Benfo went from worst to best. And he wrote a book called It's Your Ship that some 20 years ago became a New York Times bestseller. One of the first changes he made concerned the Sunday afternoon cookouts. Food was good, and the sailors would line up in a long line. And you know what those officers did? They cut in line. <laughs> Every week they cut in line. They got their own food. They went up to another deck and ate by themselves. And Michael Abershoff watched this. And guess where he went? He went to the end of the line. And those other officers saw what he did, and they didn't like it. And they had a little discussion among themselves, and they uh, selected one to go tell Mr. Abershoff, that's not the way we do it on this ship. The officers go first, we eat up there, and that's the way we do it. And Abershoff said, well, that's not the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to the back of the line, and if they run out of food, I'll be the one to suffer. He didn't make it a rule. He didn't send out a memo. But next Sunday, you know what happened? They had a cookout, and all the sailors lined up, and all the officers went to the back of the line. And that's how that ship went from Worst to best, because their captain led by example. We've got a captain too, my friends, and he didn't go to the back of the line. 
he went to the old rugged cross, didn't he? And we went from a worst case scenario to a best case scenario, from without God, without hope, far off to being brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, <clears throat> grant us grace to deny ourselves, take up our crosses, have the heart and mind of our blessed Redeemer who emptied himself and became of no reputation and who was obedient as your son, obedient to the point of death on the cross. Grant us, we pray, spirit-filled relationships where we love and care for and encourage each other and rejoice when others rejoice and weep when others weep and bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Did you like the anthem earlier? It was great, wasn't it? Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We're all, to one degree or another, heavy laden this morning, and uh, the Lord's offer stands. Come. Come to this table. He offers himself freely for all who call upon him, for all who... Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners. Bring your burdens, lay them down at the foot of the cross, and He will give you rest. If you're here as an unbeliever, we're so glad that you're here. And we encourage you to consider the, the Word of God you've heard this morning and ask for the forgiveness of your sins and ask the Lord to save you and become part of this family, we're, we're blessed to have a church family, aren't we? And uh, then, then join us at the table. But until such time as you do that, we ask you to refrain and uh, show re respect for the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who on the night he was betrayed took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Afterward, in like manner, he took the cup, and he said, Drink from this cup, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And Paul says, As often as we eat this bread, living bread, the bread of life, and drink this cup, the river of life, as it were, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again.
Let us pray. Father, for the many that are heavy laden with illness, uh, discouraged, uh, feeling helpless, we, we pray that in their weakness you will be their strength, that you will make your power known to them for Charlie Smith and Ray Tarkenton, Catherine Huddleston, Bob Watterson, Richard Wallace, Don Hayes, Dick Philpott, and Betty, Linda Stubblefield, for Landy Campbell and a host of others that are receiving uh, treatments of one sort or another. Give them great grace to sustain them and encourage them in the gospel, we pray. We thank you for Carter and Heather Womp, married yesterday. We pray for your blessings on their life to come for as long as they both shall live. We're thankful, Lord God, that we do have a family, and we're thankful that we have a Father who loves to give good gifts to His children. You know our needs. You promise to answer before we call. We thank You for providing for our greatest need of all, our, our, our Savior, our blessed Redeemer. And we pray now as He taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing the first and last stanzas of our closing hymn, number 267. Please remember Keith Day in your prayers as well. Keith has a hip replacement uh, tomorrow, second one in the last few months, I believe. So, you all know, please lift him up in your prayers. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you both now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.